Um, and my other job is vice president of sales for COP Travel and Tourism. And we are the destination marketing organization for the Northwest area of Atlanta, including Truist Park, the Battery and Cobb Gallery mm. Center. Uh, happy Cinco de Mayo. Just want to remind everyone that you do enter um, muted. So um, there, there are, are going, there's going to be an opportunity to ask questions via the chat and not verbally. Um, and I'll get, I'll get to that in a, in a moment. Um, but we do want to be mindful of everyone's schedule today. So we are beginning. Also, uh, we are recording this event today. So just let everyone know. Um, welcome to the first live online event hosted by the PCMA Southeast Chapter. And the Southeast Chapter is comprised of seven states and Puerto Rico. However, we serve over 500 members all, ac all across the country in Canada. And PCMA's statement of purpose is to educate, inspire, and listen, creating meaningful experiences where passion, purpose, and commerce come together. And we are here to achieve that today. Uh, we are honored with everyone's participation, including the PCMA president and CEO, Sheriff Karamat, and Jackie Miracle, who is manager of chapter engagement. And Sheriff and Jackie, uh, this Zoom format brings a new dimension to face-to-face -face meetings. Please take this opportunity to welcome our virtual attendees. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be on this call. And um, I, I honestly feel that I've seen more of PCMA members over the last two months than I've ever seen in my life. And I feel like if um, I, I am able to share some really quality time, I've seen the best and worst hairdos and I've seen just about everything in between, right? So, but I, 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 I'm inspired, truly inspired by the resilience and the strength the PCMA community shows during this time. And to hear the stories that I'm hearing, what people are doing in, in communities across the country in communities in, in every one of our chapters, it's absolutely heartwarming. Uh, we know truthfully that um, what we do matters. And more and more, I think that if there's anything we've gotten and a greater appreciation for face-to-face -face during this time. A um, Couple of things that I want to say to all of you, and that is that first and foremost, I hope all of you and your families are safe and healthy. And I hope the teams that you're working with are safe and healthy. I know this has not been an easy time for any of you. And I don't, um, I don't in any way tend, um, would be able to appreciate how difficult it's been for everyone in communities across the country and around the world. So um, I appreciate what you're doing. I also want to say that from the very get-go, uh, PCMA said that we wanted to be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. And that is important because I think that the, the sooner we can be a part of the, the solution, listen to our healthcare professionals and listen to those in the know, we will be further ahead to put this virus behind us and hopefully well on our way to finding a cure, which we all so desperately want. Um, so I, I'm hoping that we will be mindful of that. Uh, PCMA over the last uh, two months actually Today, it, yesterday was the start of our eight week working remote. So your entire headquarters team is working remote as all of you are. And so, um, so it's been a very different experience, but it's been a good one. And um, I want you to know that membership at PCMA, you could email us at any time, Jackie's on the call. You can contact her at any time, um, but we are here for you and anything you need, please do not hesitate. Uh, Chris, I thank you and the team um, for all you're doing for the chapter and all our members uh, in, the, in the chapter. Um, this is really, really um, great, and this webinar is great. I also want to extend my thanks to the panelists um, who are going to conduct this great webinar for us, and it's going to be very insightful, and I'm seeing uh, some of you haven't seen in a few months, actually, since convening leaders, so it's nice to see your faces. So thank you, Chris. I turn it back to you very quickly here. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, Jackie, uh, we greatly appreciate you as our chapter engagement. Um, um, so please just say hello to everyone.
Hi, everyone. Just want to echo what Sheriff said, um, that first and foremost, we hope that you're staying safe and healthy uh, and want to remind you that you can always reach out to us. Uh, we want to keep our community whole at this time. We have some great resources available for you, uh, and I've put that all in the chat. So please feel free to contact me directly or my team. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks, Jackie. Um, just a reminder for the new people who are coming on, this is being recorded live. Um, uh, we have a, approximately 170 plus attendees. And um, so we're going to get started. Uh, this live online program was designed to connect uh, us all safely and to provide a meaningful experience while learning from leaders in our industry, as well as as well as we all seek to find the new normal for meetings, business, and travel. And our goal today is not to rinse and repeat the information that you've heard these past few weeks and month, but to provide tangible examples from industry leaders. We have prepared questions for our panelists that will aim to get relevant, timely examples of moving the bar forward. The first 50 minutes of our program today will be, moder will be a moderated panel and a Q&A. We welcome you to use the chat feature to ask any questions of our panelists, and we'll do our best to get them to them throughout the program. Uh, send your questions on chat to Charlene for questions. So go to chat, see Charlene for questions, and send them to Charlene. And Charlene is monitoring the questions, and then we'll uh, pass them on to our panelists. If your question is for a specific panelist, please indicate that panelist's name when writing it in the chat. Otherwise, the question will be up for grabs. Uh, we are disabling attendees from viewing the chat pane so we can use it specifically for panelist questions. The last 10 minutes of our program has been designed for socializing, and we'll break into smaller groups for a Cinco de Mayo themed happy hour. So when that time comes, grab a drink and we can all cheers together. Now, I'll turn it over to Richard Anderson, Vice President of Strategic Services at Shepherd LiveX, who will introduce our panelists and begin the Q&A portion of our event. Thank you, Chris. Greetings, everyone. I appreciate being invited. Uh, looking forward to some terrific insights uh, in the next 40 minutes or so. And uh, let me begin by introducing our esteemed panel, uh, beginning with Pam Ballinger. Pam is the Senior Director of Meetings and Exhibits at the American Association for Cancer Research. Akshar Patel. Akshar is the Vice President of Conventions for AHOA. Uh, and Kim Allison, Senior Director of Convention Sales at the Georgia World Congress Center. And Mark Barton, the Area Director of Sales for Marriott International. Welcome everyone. Pam, we're gonna start with you because you have the distinction of having just done a virtual event. <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the early, early <laughs> practitioners here. So I know your organization made the decision uh, to convert your April event. Uh, when did you actually make that decision? Well, we terminated the meeting on March 10th, and we decided that we would do at least virtual one on March 16th. Um, and we were going to try and reschedule the meeting uh, for the rest of it, but um, we're doing virtual two at the end of June. That's a pretty quick turn for an event of your size. How many attendees do you typically have at the in-person? We usually run about 22 to 23,000. Wow, and how many did you end up having at your virtual? 62,000. Impressive. Uh, I'm curious, do you, uh, did you charge for your virtual attendees? No, we did not. We did. We determined that the, at least the first one would be free. Um, it was very important for us because it was the clinical trials and it was time sensitive. So it had to get out and uh, we made the decision to not charge. Terrific. Well, I have a ton of questions for you, but uh, we need to get things rolling. So uh, I'm going to start out with one of the more important ones. I'm really interested in what are your your most important key learnings from doing this first one, and then how those key learnings may affect uh, the second one, which I know you already have underway in terms of planning. So I think it's like with anything else, it's, it's, it's the communication. We really learned 
to um, communicate not only to our speakers who are used to running into a speaker ready room five minutes before they present to sticking to the deadlines to make sure that we decided to go with recording. So all of our presentations were recorded. So everything had to be time sensitive, which was very, very difficult for scientists. Um, the second thing was the communication that we had with our vendor is really to sit down and understand what your expectations are and clearly understand whether they can meet them. Um, we made, we went through this so quickly that as we got into it, we found that initially some of our communications were not as strong as they should have been. So it is the same as planning a regular meeting and a virtual meeting. It is about communicating with your vendor, setting your expectations and what your goals are, and then communicating clearly to the attendees and the prisoners. And so much of what we did was on the fly. So we are now sitting down with kickoff for virtual meeting two and making sure that all of us know are on the same page. Terrific, thank you very much. Uh, I've got a few more questions for you, Pam, but we're gonna move on and we'll come back here in a couple of minutes. Akshar, um, I know that your annual conference was scheduled for last month uh, in Orlando and you have all decided to postpone. Um, obviously, making people feel safe and secure you know, is top of mind for most everyone. So as you're planning for the postponed event, uh, what accommodations are you making? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. While there's so much uncertainty with, um, you know, protocols or mandates coming out and uh, there's a lot of different messaging, whether it's on the federal side or the state side and the local side of, of what is to implement and what is not to implement. We started our own kind of, you know, safety and crisis plan internally. Um, we know our business and our, and our events and our attendees better than probably everyone, right? So we know what the red flags and the hot buttons may be. And, and lucky for myself, uh, I'm going to give a, a quick shout out to people like Shepard, PRG, and, and other service providers, Hyatt, Hilton, and, and Marriott, and others, that they came together and are supporting our cause because I feel that we're, our, we're right now postponed to August. So we're going to be in that kind of uh, guinea pig phase, and all eyes are going to be on us and our, our service providers. So to make sure that everyone is successful, we are having almost daily calls uh, or weekly calls with some of the, the key service providers and team members to say, hey, I thought of this. And then what we're trying to also do is, you know, if a prime example here, if, if all 110 of you were to come to the AHO event, I probably don't know where you have been in the last 30 or 60 days. However, I could probably pinpoint all the touch points that you probably have had to encounter from leaving your homes and your families to come to the event and go back. So we're trying to put ourselves in the attendees shoes to go through all of that so that we're, we're well prepared and thinking of, Oh, I need a sanitization station here, or someone may feel uncomfortable here. So let me put in something that would be comfortable there. So we're, you know, we're role playing, but we're also creatively thinking outside the box with uh, many people, just like everyone else on this call. Terrific. I'm pretty sure everyone here knows you, but just in case they don't, would you tell everyone who your audience is, your membership? Yeah, so our uh, association is AHOA, um, the Asian American Hotel Owners Association. All of our hotel owners are here in the US. We represent roughly 19,500 plus hotel owners, mainly on the select service and, and someone on the large portfolio side. So it's, when we decided to postpone, um, we made an internal vow that we would not, we did not want to cancel because uh, that would definitely send some red flags as well as the wrong signal for this industry. So, you know, we said we're going to postpone, we're going to get it back together, we're going to work at it. And uh, but as many of you can imagine, um, we're running a lot of parallel tracks. And, you know, if there's anything I can do besides this call to help anyone on the hotel side or kind of get some more information, uh, I'm here to help everyone. That's very kind. Thank you, Akshar. Mark Barton, we're moving on to you. Um, I know that uh, Arne Sorensen and Marriott have been at the center of uh, your stay at home, we will travel again campaign. Uh, I'm very curious about how Marriott and all the other various property departments 
are managing the reopen of properties. And just to keep it close to home, can you tell us anything specific about, you know, an Atlanta area property and how they're prepping? Yeah, sure. I think, I think it, first of all, I think it's important to uh, uh, say thank you and to shout out to all of you. You know, this has been a very difficult time for the travel industry in general, right? And I know that some of that was already touched on, but I think it's very important uh, that we can't say thank you enough and to hang in there enough, right? Uh, during this tough time. So we certainly appreciate all of you being here today and continuing to hang tough. Um, you know, we're, we're now living in this age of COVID-19. I think it's important that we, if you'll permit me for a little bit, I can go back a little bit into the February timeframe because I think it's important for um, everyone to understand that from a specifically a Marriott perspective, but also even from an industry perspective, but specifically for Marriott, we were already uh, moving into uh, a scenario where we were um, cleaning at a higher standard as early as February, simply because of what we had seen in China. And we've got cleaning standards for the norovirus, which is very similar. If you look at the CDC guidelines, those are very similar standards. So we were already moving in this direction. And I say that only for this purpose before I get into what we're doing uh, next is because, you know, for our industry, while, while this virus is definitely new, um, having to address, you know, high levels of standards for uh, strange viruses coming in the door is not something that's new to our industry, right? Which I'm sure that all of you recognize. So, you know, as we, um, however, when we get into this um, COVID-19 era, you know, you probably saw just recently where um, Marriott put together a global cleanliness council that um, is all of our senior leaders from across global operations and disciplines like housekeeping, engineering, food safety, occupational health, and the associate well-being. Um, and we also have included outside experts and I'll tell you, you know, it wasn't listed in the, um, it was mentioned a little bit in the press release, but I think probably the most important uh, outside experts for us to have paused and listened to was our customers, some of who are on, you know, this call today. And we did meet with a lot of our customers and we continue to be listening to our customers because we've got to understand what are the concerns and where are the uh, pressure points for them. Um, once we uh, did that and we put together this council, then we reached out to outside experts like uh, Echo Lab, Adventist Healthcare, um, Purdue, and their hospitality tourism management school, you know, as well as uh, Cornell, uh, to uh, start putting together our cleanliness standards, right? So some of the enhanced technology that we're now uh, pushing out to our hotels, uh, some have already received and you know, some will be getting soon, or like you've seen a lot on the electrostatic sprayers with the hospital grade uh, disinfectants coming out. And really what that does is it allows us to clean our rooms faster and, and to be more pervasive in the rooms uh, to really make sure that, you know, people can walk in with confidence and all the nooks and crannies have been uh, disinfected. So, um, Certainly, we're also looking at other technologies. Most of our hotels have keyless access to their rooms, but for those individuals that are using keys, we're looking at ultraviolet light technologies and other technologies to, to make sure that we're uh, disaffecting those keys. One of the things that we had started with before we went to some of these you know, higher standards of cleanliness were just some of the basics like signage in our hotels. Every one of our hotels, you mentioned local uh, marketplace. I can say this in the local market right now that all of our hotels in the Atlanta market, you know, already have signage and floor stickers to remind people to social distance, uh, signage in all the hotels, signage at the front doors, uh, monitors around to remind folks to social distance. And so that way, as they're lining up for their Starbucks coffee, uh, they can stay six feet apart. Um, so uh, we're continuing in that direction. Um, you know, we've got um, a lot of um, uh, new technologies that are gonna be coming that you're going to see. And uh, we're gonna continue to listen to the customers and the experts and make changes as we move forward. 
But I think it's important for everybody to know that when they start meeting in our hotels again, that they can be assured that we're doing everything in our power to create a safe environment for meetings to come back. Thank you, Mark. Kim Allison, uh, I think we learned maybe around April 12th that the Georgia World Congress Center was being transformed into, I think it was a 200 uh, patient care facility. Can you share any stories with us about how that all came together and how it's all gone? Sure, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy to be here and share the story that so many convention centers and buildings are going through. Uh, we did receive information that the governor and FEMA and every alphabet soup group you can imagine was going to come to our building and take a look at um, space for a potential 200 bed facility. Um, one of our pillars is to uh, provide and improve for the room and the lives of every Georgian. So it's our pleasure to be able to serve as such. And um, I also was concerned about what would happen if we became a facility, how that would impact our hospitality community, also Georgians who are looking to get their jobs back. So I was pleased to be able to serve on the forefront in the site visit experience where we could ask those questions. And I know our customers, as well as everyone who works in the community, was very interested in finding out how the process would end up. And I was very pleased to say that every group that came in uh, assured us that the building would be in better shape when uh, everybody left it from a cleanliness standpoint. And all of the mounds of paperwork and laptops that people pulled out on a site visit with uh, protocols and cleaning and maps and crawling through uh, venting areas to see how the air flowed in the building, looking at the original architectural designs. Uh, I never had more questions about ice manufacturing than uh, during this process. So it was very interesting uh, to go through the process, not only from the perspective of knowing that we could care for those patients, uh, but also knowing that the integrity of the building would remain. And um, we have ended up, right now we have nine patients and we have patients who are on the back end of having COVID and um, they were not um, the folks who were on ventilators, but those folks who at some point were in a hospital and tested positive so they can come and post quarantine in the building in a safe space. So we're happy to be able to provide that. Thank you very much for doing that. I'm just curious, when do you expect, expect to get the building back uh, to do business? They uh, were very respectful of us, uh, probably because I looked at them with my eyes crossed, um, but they were very respectful of that process and very kind. Uh, the out date is May 21st with a five day remediation uh, where they will again do uh, top to bottom refurbishing. So I feel like May 26th, it's going to be the cleanest place on the planet. So we should all come there. <laughs> Terrific. All right, Pam, we're heading back to you. Um, getting back to in-person events, once your annual next year in D.C. takes place, uh, what specific changes are you planning to make to things like layout, registration, general session, exhibits, et cetera? Well, we really haven't started working on the major changes um, with the space. I think one of the things we're under discussion is probably doing a hybrid or working on a virtual piece that will go in tandem with it, anticipating that we're going to have less um, attendees. In reality, we don't fit in DC um, and we were squeezing everybody in. So I kind of look at it as, well, maybe this isn't the most terrible thing in the world because now if we're working with, you know, a, a lesser number, um, anticipating there will be people that won't be able to um, travel. But we haven't pulled out. Obviously, uh, we're going to have to look at the setting the sessions with a lot more space, not crowding people in. Um, we haven't really, because we've been focusing so much on a virtual that we have kind of tabled, what are we going to do with posters? What are we going to do with food and beverage events? 
Um, we also have 35 different events that are occurring between June and December that are our smaller meetings. So we're actually looking and focusing on those very intensely. And the 21 meeting, uh, I, you know, we just, we haven't come up for air yet to determine what that's gonna look like. I wanna hopefully sit out and look at it in, in August. We've certainly canceled all our sites and um, we're gonna do everything, all our plannings virtually, which is a little different, um, looks very different. But um, I, as I say, I, we haven't come up from air. We've got another virtual that we've got in six weeks. <laughs> Since you brought up hybrid, I'm just curious, a very informal poll. How many people think that the hybrid format is a great way to go regardless of being in a pandemic? Show of hands. I. Okay, just curious, thank you. Akshar, we're coming back to you. Uh, because you have an inside track <laughs> with hotel owners, I'm just curious about the kinds of conversations you're having with them. What are they telling you about, you know, their business as well as uh, uh, their concerns about attending an in-person meeting. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll kind of piggyback on what Mark said earlier. Uh, Marriott was definitely one of the, the leaders in putting this safe kind of clean program together. Obviously, Hilton and Hyatt have also done the same and are following suit. IHG, I don't think it's far behind if they haven't already. Um, you know, if you look at the calendar of all the hospitality industry events, a majority of them have either canceled or postponed. I'm talking about, you know, the brand events or uh, some of the, the lodging conferences, either they postponed or canceled, the NYUs and, and those type of events. Um, we're kind of looked at as uh, the event right now, if, if we do uh, move forward in August as kind of reigniting the industry and everyone is still holding uh, strong to that, our exhibitors are. So any one of you want to come see what a show looks like in August as, as a test phase, you are all welcome. I may use hands and feet to help me out, but um, you know, the, I think the, the enthusiasm is there because people need to one move so that the economy starts stimulating again. Um, and in, in all this, we have to remember we're all an interdependency to someone else's success. So if we can get people moving from their cities, their homes into another event space that is going to generate not only revenue, but that's going to generate a lot of different opportunities across the board. So I think people are still um, excited. You know, the, the, the one thing that I thought would happen when we postpone is I may see a lot of exhibitors cancel, but I know there's a couple of people on this, on this call that will back me up that we have held strong to our exhibitors. Um, we typically see anywhere above 700 or so. Yeah. We've had some cancellations roughly maybe about 80 or so, but, out of 700, 80 is almost nothing. And, and 600 plus exhibitors are still holding strong to come to Hohokan and, and network and start this um, industry back up. So that gives me a lot of good moral support, but also uh, motivation that people are wanting to start back up again. Thank you, Akshar. Uh, Mark, back to you. Um, do you have any sense or timeline of when you think face-to-face -face events will be happening at Marriott Properties? Uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I, I was thinking about this question and we actually have some small meetings uh, toward the end of May and some of our um, uh, courtyard uh, type properties that are, that are coming in smaller meetings. Um, we've had a couple that were wanting to meet prior to the restrictions being taken off um, on May 13th in Georgia. And of course we had to, um, relocate those to a different date. So, I mean, we're already starting to see people wanting to come back and, and we find ourselves being the ones that are trying to make sure that we work with our customers and help them make the right decisions. And, uh, and then we have some coming into the city as early as early going into late June. So, um, you know, we, and so we're prepared for those. Um, and we're pretty excited. I mean, to, uh, Akshar's, uh, comments. I mean, you know, we know, and, and to the comment about virtual, we know that virtual will probably be a bigger percentage here at the beginning, perhaps, um, for a while. Um, and then I think as time moves forward, I think that it will have its place perhaps in meetings, 
uh, forever to some degree. And I think that, um, but I also believe that being able to use virtual so much, all of us have also run into the challenges that, that come in a virtual world, right? I mean, I would much prefer to be sitting in a meeting room with all of you guys right now, enjoying a nice break in the back of the room, uh, personally, and then having a drink at the bar afterward, not virtually. Um, and I believe that you know there there is room for virtual, just as I believe that there's always always a place where people need to connect as people, and uh, we've just got to get um, the world to be a, you know at a place where it's safe to do that. You know. Thank you, uh, Kim. I know from the conversations that we're having with our customers, um, floor plans and layouts are very uh, important in terms of physical distancing. I'm just wondering if you've had any, uh, what kinds of conversations and solutions are you guys working on at the GWCC? Yeah, thank you, Rich. We are working on that. We have a business reopening plan team uh, that consists of 11 sub teams who are all working on their different area, everything from food service to, uh, you know, a virtual component, how we can assist our customers uh, in that way, as well as the design and layout of the space. Uh, we've also, um, we're going to roll out that plan on May 11th uh, with the idea that we work uh, and get some feedback from our customer advisory board and customers on that program. Also, we have just entered into an agreement with a company called Concept 3D, and they are working with us on a beta test right now uh, where we can uh, work with customers virtually. I hear, you know, everyone, Pam, you're doing virtual site planning and all of that. So we have two options for that. The Concept 3D where customers will be able to lay out their own space uh, it will be the actual meeting rooms at the Georgia World Congress Center, and they will be able to look at what their needs are and lay them out. We'll be able to work with them as well and walk them through that. Uh, but it's really a unique feature where uh, people can actually design their own space without having to have a CAD drawing for each opportunity. And then we have three robots that will actually walk people through the space um, on each level, uh, doing a virtual site tour. So uh, very excited about those opportunities. That's fun, cool. So Pam, uh, as a supplier partner, <clears throat> I know that we feel that it's up to us to partner with you uh, to find ways to help make your guests uh, feel safe uh, moving forward. What kinds of expectations do you think you're gonna have for your various supplier partners as you get back into planning next year for next year's event? So, you know, obviously for audiovisual um, and, you know, Deco, uh, we're gonna be looking at them to reconfigure and redesign the space to utilize, to take into consideration um, the social distancing, which, you know, I, I I have to feel optimistic and hopeful that maybe by April of next year, you know, it, it, that six feet maybe could be cut to three feet. Um, realistically, uh, we're going to, we're going to reach out to all of our, you know, I, I brought up, I, the, the biggest issue for, in my mind has come up is busing. You know, how are you, you know, we pack those buses, the shuttle buses. So we're going to need to work with our, our vendor partner on figuring out how to do, how to social distance on the bus, how to load the buses and get people so that they're comfortable or what the buses are, how the buses are gonna be cleaned. I mean, these are all the things that we're, you know, we've got to make a checklist. We've got to, to go down by each one of where, you know, we offer childcare. How is that gonna look? I mean, I, I keep making lists of, and it's sort of a domino effect. I think of this and then I think of, but, but what about this? And then what about this? So I think we're gonna to turn to all of our partners that we, we work with for the me annual meeting and have to sit down and take each of the lists and say, what are you gonna do about this? What are you gonna do about this? So, you know, obviously in the convention center, we have to work with them and we're gonna to have to work with food and beverage. It's mind boggling to be honest with you. Um, I, I don't, I don't have any or all of, or even a smidgen of the answers on this one. 
yeah, it's a massive team project. I know that we, like uh, most supplier partners, are working on our own anticipated best practices. But until we're all in it, um, you know, things are going to morph and evolve, and uh, they'll just change. So I'm hoping that we all continue to come together and, and share all those. Best well, I think, I think what we're going to have for best practices in September are going to change the I, I think what we're going to need to do in our industry is constantly evolve, constantly be flexible, constantly change for whenever, whatever the rules are. Um, by, by next year, it could be totally different. 18 months, we could be back to normal or we could be, you know, equating. It's sort of the way the governors have done the, the three, you know, you go, there's, there's level one, you do step one, then you do step two, then you do step three. And I think that's what we're going to have to do with the meetings is we're going to have steps yeah. and they're going to change. Akshar, Pam brought up food service. That <laughs> obviously brings with it a whole new set of considerations and, and things to solve for. Uh, what kinds of things are, are you working on? Peanut butter and jelly for everyone. What'd you say? Peanut butter and jelly for everyone. <laughs> No, it, it's a great question. So for some of you that know my program, we actually use a not only the, the traditional food and beverage from the convention center or a hotel, we also infuse um, a third party um, authentic Indian caterer that comes on site and, and provides uh, Indian meals. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this question with a, in another way. Um, Having a food and beverage background, I knew that buffets were probably the first thing that is going to go away just for queuing purposes and, and prep purposes and et cetera. So I actually took the approach that we all have to be transparent in this situation. You know, we have a white elephant in the room or any elephant in the room, and we're going to have to tackle it, whether we like it or not. And uh, so the first thing I, I said to my internal leadership team, and I even said to our uh, board, uh, the vice chairman, who's also the convention chair this year, I said, hey, look, you know, food is a, is a big thing at our convention. It's kind of like everyone's home that brings people together. But we may have not uh, the luxury to do buffets. And even pushing that a little further, we may not have the luxury of infusing a third party cater. Because if I look at it from the, the venue standpoint or a hotel standpoint, or even a, a center plate or Sodexo type standpoint, everyone is is just scared of the insurance and the liability, right? So, you know, we we as professionals have a have a responsibility of also being that ambassador, not only to ourselves, but to our our associations, our clients, if you're on the independent side or whatever whatever your status is, is that you're gonna have to go through these tough questions. And the the flip side of that is um, the experience side of it, right? How do you still create an experience that people will either enjoy or remember? But the other piece of this is that there are different operating costs for all of us. All of our budgets are different. All of our revenue streams are different. And, you know, for Pam to do a plated meal for 22,000 people, it's, it may not be a, a situation that she can do. And, uh, you know, for me, if, if nothing, uh, as an Indian cuisine, comes plated. So do you go to family style, all these questions. So we started having these conversations just so there's not a, a, a sticker shock or just a, a protocol shock at the end of the day, because people need to know. Um, and those of you that are connected with me on LinkedIn, and if you're not, I, I'd be happy to connect. But I today I posted, we're looked at as the magician in this situation. We're, we're looked at to solve a problem that no one even knew existed. Or, and when that light is that switch is flicked on. Everyone is going to look at us and we can't be Casper at that point. We have to be thinking on our feet and have solutions or out of the box, uh, you know, methods to, to move forward. We've only got about 10 minutes left. So two more quick questions, one each for Mark and uh, Kim, and then we'll go to audience questions. So Mark, um, what do you think will be the most difficult lingering issues for the hotel industry once we get past the worst of COVID. Oh, okay. Well, you know, actually, um, Akshar actually hit on a few, just some of these things that are carrying over, right? Whatever, you know, because there's going to be changes to how we have to deliver, right, um, in the near term. And then, you know, how do we navigate that once 
COVID is in our rearview mirror, you know, what is hanging out there. And we've got to balance some of these decisions um, between making sure that we're taking care of our guests and our customers while at the same time, making sure that we're honoring the commitment we have to our stakeholders to be able to make, you know, run a profitable business. I mean, that is what we have to consider, right? Because if we right. can't do that, then you don't have the venues or the quality of venues that, that all of us desire. So that's definitely going to be one of the challenges that we have moving forward is what is that going to do to our cost structures and how do we deliver that uh, in an effective and an efficient way? Um, I would say too, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, as, as you have virtual coming into the meetings and, you know, the impact of social distancing in the near term and how much of that carries into the, into the out term and what does it do to our overall group volume of business to where we're trying to remix our hotels of, how much group are we going to be taking versus transient or business travel type business or leisure, right? I think there's going to be some uh, mixing um, going on in our hotels because while many of them, the tip of the spear for some of our larger properties and many of our um, what we call core properties is, is group. You know, a lot of our hotels right now are 70%, 80% group. Um, and so what will that mix look like on the other side of COVID and what will those groups look like and how do we stack the groups in in order for our hotels to be successful as we're then layering trans in and uh, business travel on top of that. Um, so, you know, I think that those are probably uh, the tougher questions that we're going to have to ask ourselves. They're not very exciting questions. They're not very exciting things. They don't sizzle. Right, but these are the real issues that we're, we're gonna have to deal with in that post-COVID world. Thank you, Mark. Kim, uh, Pam and I talked a little bit about safety being uh, team sport or shared responsibility between everyone. I'm curious from a venue point of view, what expectations do you have of planners? Well, we agree that you know safety and security is the thing. I, I can feel it when customers are asking us about coming back, just the desire so much to guarantee that people will be safe. And as all of you know, there is no guarantee because we can't control where people have been. So uh, what we would like to do is work, uh, as Pam said, in open communication from day one with everyone to talk about what their expectations are so that we can meet those expectations. Uh, service delivery will be the key as we roll out uh, and start accepting groups and opening our doors. Uh, but, but everything from the opening of the door to people going out a different door to assure their safety will be something that we need to talk about. Understanding, as, as Mark was talking about layering groups, you know, we have three buildings at the Georgia World Congress Center and helping customers, if we have three different groups in three different buildings, helping those folks feel comfortable and perhaps engaging groups who are gonna be in the building together to understand what the plans of each other are so that we can all assure each other's safety. So I think it just boils down to a basic open communication and uh, we're actually getting together tomorrow to look at a 30, 60, 90, and even 120 day out uh, communication plan with customers so that we can include everybody's expectations with our business reopening plan. Mm -hmm. So we understand where we're gonna be in June, in July. And as I think I heard Pam say, if we don't understand that we're gonna continue to evolve, then we're missing the mark. But we know that whatever we roll out in, in June or July will be different than what we're gonna be looking at in September. And we hope that everyone will help us provide the feedback uh, to keep adjusting those plans. Thank you very much, Kim. All right, we have about five minutes left. Charlene, what have you got? There are a ton of questions. Um, several uh, start out with Pam. They're asking if A, you uh, can share who you used what platform you used for the virtual meeting, and if four separate people asked if you would be willing to share what it cost to do a virtual meeting for 62,000 people. Um, I really don't think I would share that um, to a group this large, and <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy for anyone to um, reach out to me. Um, you, I think you probably all have my email. If you don't, it's it's uh, Pamela.Ballinger at AACR.org. 
Um, also, I think in this particular Venn group, I, I don't want to, I'm not totally, I don't want to sell. Um, well, I, I, I will be honest that, you know, we, we reached out to our vendor who does our audiovisual and our deco and asked them to uh, give us a proposal for and what their platform was. Um, but there's, you know, we also, for some of our smaller ones, we've gone out and done a lot of proposal. We've gotten proposals. There's a lot of really good companies out there. So I don't want to be the one to sit here and say, this is, so on a, per, you know, person to person, I'll be happy to share that. That's perfect. That's perfect. Mark, uh, we've got a question. How are hotels handling the additional space needed in lobbies and quick food service areas? Uh, keeping in mind the six foot space dis distancing required. Yeah, I think, you know, you, you'd heard me mention a while ago, um, you know, all of them have the stickers on the floors and there are reminders spaced out around the hotel. Each property is a little different, but we've got the tools out there to do it. And part of it, and, you know, part of it is just the signage to remind customers. I mean, the one thing that um, that I am reminding, you know, the teams is that we own making sure that the customers have an educated and safe environment in which to come into, you know, at the end of the day, we can't um, necessarily, you know, we can certainly remind people, but being in the hospitality business, we also want to make sure that, um, you know, to some degree, if people are going to do what the people want to do, right? So we've got to provide them all the tools necessary and all the education necessary. Um, when it comes to food and beverage, we are, you know, providing a lot of grab and goes right now. And um, as everybody has mentioned, you know, we're peeling back the layers of this onion uh, to create some of that on property as we're moving forward. But um, so far, we've had we've had great success with it. Um, you know, I think part of it has been that travelers that we have had in, the customers that we have had in have been very understanding and very patient. Um, and we've also taken real-time feedback from those people who've been bold enough to travel, then we're going to be bold enough to take their feedback and, uh, and spread that around the rest of the country. So um, I hope that answers the question, but um, if, if there's a follow-up, I'll be glad to address it. No, that's perfect. Thank you. Another question, generally, does anyone know the reduction in capacity chart capability for meeting space setups going to look like? For example, is there a percentage of the original numbers and then to the, to the new normal? I'll leave that open to the group if anyone wants to field that. I'll try to tackle that one. Um... You know, six feet in any direction means a person needs 36 square feet in any direction, right? So I did a quick exercise just the other day. If I took a 55,000 square foot ballroom that could traditionally seat about, you know, three to 4,000 for a general session and, you know, a decent amount of space for AV production and whatnot, I could only get about 1,200 seats in there with six feet in any direction. Now, if, if we go to three feet, um, you know, that may mean about 2000. Um, but then I also did a, another equation for, uh, an 8,000 square foot room that if you had uh, a classroom situation, that means one per six or whatnot, typically, you know, you could get about 600, I think theater when I did the, 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 the calculation with a one per six foot in 8,000 square feet with a 16 by 24 stage. I was able to get 200 uh, people in there. So I, I would say for our purposes, knowing what we know now that people are using six feet as a, as a brand standard or just a, a stamp at the moment, we all need 36 square feet in any direction. Perfect. For Pam or Akshar, once we're beyond 2020 and pertaining to your largest meeting, to what degree or percentage would you estimate that your own virtual meeting will diminish attendance at your live meeting? And or do you see an opportunity for your virtual meeting to actually attract new attendees to your live meeting? Well, I'll take, I'll take the fact that um, for our first virtual, you know, we had three times what we normally um, have at our annual meeting. 
And definitely there were people that have probably never come to AACR um, for one reason or another. So we've definitely picked up new possible members and new possible maybe future attendees. Um, I personally don't think that when we can go back to face-to-face -face meetings that we will see the virtual diminish what we get. When we can go back to what is a normal, sci I, I'm speaking from doing medical meetings where scientists come to the meeting, not only for the science, but they come because it's an opportunity for them to network. And there's a lot of science that goes on you know, outside of the meeting rooms, in the halls, in the, and there's, and that, that's lost. That is not there. I mean, we, we had Q and A and we had questions, you know, we had interaction, but it is not the same. So I don't see that the virtual is going to diminish what we get for face to face when we go back. But I do see that the virtual is giving us a huge opportunity to bring people into the AACR that have never been able to do it because of economics or travel restrictions or whatever. So I think it's, I think it's a, it's a blessing in both ways, to be honest. That's great. Did that answer the question? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and if, if we have time for one more question, Richard, what do you think? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is for all of the panel. When do you feel people will so feel safe enough to travel via air to attend life, live events? Well, it's, there's two different kinds of travel there because I think we'll see people domestically start to travel, but I think international travel is going to be slower. Um, and since we're like 30% international, um, you know, I think it's going to be longer for that. I, I don't think people are going to feel 100% comfortable international travel for another year, but domestic maybe eight months, six to eight months. I hope some in June because I'm kind of counting on that. So, uh, you know, if, if I, if you want some realness there, you know, um, I, you know, I don't think it's going to, I agree with Pam. I don't think it's going to be a windfall then, but um, you know, if you look at it, I mean, you look at what the airlines have done. It's, it's so far um, with the exception of a couple, maybe it's been, uh, it's been somewhat spectacular and how they jumped in front and started cleaning these planes and doing everything that they were doing. So we're excited about that. And then of course it kind of crescendos for us going in for the rest of the year. We've got a few more groups, you know, of course, as you get into July and August, people are hanging in there with us more. Um, and um, I think it's going, and I, and I applaud Pam and I applaud Akshar for everything that you've done on the meetings front to, um, to boldly keep moving forward. I think that that's what it's going to take. It's going to take those that are willing like yourselves to continue to boldly move forward uh, in order to over time uh, get to a place where people are traveling again. The other half of that too is even being in this business and even being, you know, as bad as it's been is, you know, we all want it to be safe, you know, um, I still have long hair and haven't been to get my hair cut because I've got an 83 year old mom that might come into my house. So I got to take care of mom. Right. And um, so, you know, we want it to be safe. So I would say probably you'll see some travel start coming back in July. It'll continue to crescendo, you know, barring a wave in the fall um, or, a, you know, uh, another bad situation in the fall and early winter time frame. then I think you'll see a slow crescendo to the end of the year. That's Mark Barton's opinion, not Marriott's, okay? I, I, do, I do just want to interject that some of the travel coming back isn't even necessarily safety as much as it's going to be economics. Sure. Is going to be the cost of, you know, all the things that the airlines and the, and the reduced seats, what is that going to cost to fly? Mm -hmm. And what are the economics? I know for um, the academic institutions and some of our scientists who they work for, um, they're losing big dollars. So they're putting restrictions on travel just because there's no, they don't have the money. So right. I think we all have to take into consideration that there's more than safety issues that we all have to be concerned with. 
Well, and Pam, to your point, I mean, even Marriott as a, as a travel company, right? Of course, you know, we, we will be, you know, certainly we will still have people traveling, but not as many as we did for the rest of the year. Right. I mean, I'll just be real with you guys. Certainly we'll be out there and we will be traveling, but you know, we have to watch our dollars as well because we have stakeholders that rely on us to do that. So that's a fair statement. I think on the travel side of it is, um, is, is something that falls on us as well as how much of the communication as well as the comfort level we give. But I also believe that while airline travel will take a little longer to come back, but I do see a lot of the drive-in traffic that's going to increase. So, you know, this is an opportunity for, if you have an annual that's coming up um, and you have enough time, to maybe, maybe you split it into two sections of the country or even go four zones at that point. Um, it may require some type of bylaw change or whatever it is, but if you know you've got attendees or membership in, in dense areas, could you create many, mini conventions in that sense in the drive-in traffic. Um, and I think, you know, people like Mark would definitely be willing to assist with clusters of Marriott hotels across the country to say, you know, if, if I came to him and said, I've got four meetings I want to put in four different sections of the country or even my GSOs, this is the time to leverage all those relationships and, and break it up, uh, but reduce the one liability, increase the comfort levels, increase, uh, you know, just retention at that point. And there, there's, I'm a big believer at this point, there's the S in SOP has dropped um, as of March 12th, at least for me. So it's all operating procedures and there's nothing standard about it. So it, they all have to be manipulated or changed with, with every day. And, and this is the time to do it um, because at that point, people will at least visually see, yeah, you can travel, which may then give, uh, you know, a more psychiatric feeling to say, why not try a plane the next time? I think it, it, it'll be okay to do. So uh, let's get creative. Great. Yeah, I would, say, I would say to that point as well, like when we look at what's coming back, even right now, it's drive market, it's leisure. Um, you know, we had Hilton Heads, the one hotel in the country this weekend, they're expecting to be at 70%, you know, so, um, and it's all drive and some of it's local. And um, so, but then most of our hotels are not that yet. I mean, even in China, the, uh, you know, in January, those hotels that were open were running six to 10% right now without the rest of the world traveling into China, those hotels are now back up to between 30 and 40%. Um, and it is, again, a lot of it is local travel, um, you know, so uh, that's an interesting perspective as well, yeah. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Akshar. Thank you, Kim and Mark, and to everyone for participating today. Um, and I do want to, you know, uh, sometimes you run the risk when you when you say a, a special thank you, but I do want to say a special thank you to Michelle Lorber, who is on our PCMA board as the director of live events. Uh, she's worked very hard in uh, putting all of this together. So thank you very much for that, Michelle. Um, what we would like to do, we can take this all also to PCMA Catalyst. There is a Southeast. Oh, we lost Chris. Oh. That's the joy of doing digital. You, people come and go so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Charlene, do you want to wrap it up? I think we lost a bunch of people at one shot. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, I think that leaves it to you. Hey, well, you know, I've got my my cerveza here ready to go for Cinco de Mayo, so cheers. <laughs> All right, Michelle. I don't know if we got Chris back, but that was our that was our one uh our one our one flaw. So I think that went pretty well. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. It was great. Oh, Thank you. Out. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's Chris. Chris. Oh, there's Chris. There's Charlene.
sorry about that. <laughs>